significant event, which was the greatest event, is something called VE Day. VE Day stands for Victory in Europe Day. And basically what this day is, it's a, just focus on me. This is the day that the people in Europe celebrated the absolute surrender of Nazi Germany to the U.S. and allied forces. Hitler was dead. He, he killed himself. And all the Nazi generals gathered together and they signed the document totally surrendering in defeat to the United States and the allied forces. And, and it, was a, it was a day of celebration to see that the enemy in Europe had been defeated, that the enemy that was trying to take over the world, that had killed six million Jews in the Holocaust, was finally defeated. It was a day of rejoicing. It was a day of celebration. Uh, the people danced in the streets. How many know victory feels good? How many love to walk in victory? The people danced in the streets. In, in France, they rejoiced because the country was liberated. In England, they rejoiced because their boys came home and there was no longer uh, missiles being dropped on the country. In the United States, as the U.S. soldiers came into New York City, there was ticker tape parade. People were dancing in the street and, and even strangers were kissing each other. I have a, a picture in my office because I, I want my office to represent some of the cities I love. And I have a picture that represents San Diego and New York together, two cities I love. And, and it's a sailor. Are there any ex-sailors in the house? And he squids. Come on, brother Hidalgo. And there's a sailor who it grabs a girl right off the street and bows her and he's kissing her. How many know that? Because right there by the midway, it's been immortalized in a statue. It was a great day of celebration. And how many know whenever the enemy's defeated, that's a time to celebrate. That's a time to rejoice. And they were rejoicing that the enemy had been defeated. So the first significant day was that VE day. But the second significant day that I want to talk to you about was an event that took place on June 4th, 1944. And this was not a day of celebration, but it was actually a strategic day. Someone say strategic day. It, it was not only a strategic day, but it was also a day of great sacrifice. It was called D-Day. And some of you may know this, but on D-Day, 156,000 U.S., British, and Canadian troops stormed five beaches in Normandy, France. It was on that day that there was great courage and great sacrifice from those who were involved. And what you find is that these 150,000 amphibious troops, it had never been done in the history of mankind. To have that many soldiers, it had never been done in the history of war, to have that many soldiers storm five beaches simultaneously. And as these men stormed those beaches, they did so with great courage in a spirit of sacrifice. Now, let me tell you what happened to the enemy is that as these men stormed the beaches, the enemy was shook to the core. Come on, somebody, because how many know courage and bravery from God's people will shake the enemy to the core? Come on, help me preach a little bit this morning. They were shook to the core. Some people say that because of the fierce advancement of the U.S., and military troops on that day, that it actually created confusion in the Nazi ranks. That the leadership of the Nazi military began to become confused. And how many know whenever the people of God begin to stand up, the enemy gets confused? I'm preaching already. Come on. The enemy gets confused. And they say this about D-Day. And the reason it's significant is be, it is said that D-Day was the beginning of the end of the war. Here's my point this morning. 4,000 men were lost on that day. 4,000 men laid their life down on those beaches of Normandy. But I want you to know 152,000 courageous soldiers broke through enemy lines. I, I want you to clap by faith. I want you to catch this word. They broke through the enemy lines. That's what we're doing here. Come on, somebody. They broke through the enemy lines, and what happened was that the enemy was pushed back. When they broke through enemy lines and the enemy was pushed back, they created something called the beachhead. 
in the glossary of military terms is called an FOB, a forward operating base. They now opened up a base in enemy territory. They opened up a forward operating base where troops could be trained, troops could be prepared, troops could be armed so that they could begin to turn the tide of the battle. They could begin to turn the tide of the battle. And that's what God is saying to you this morning. God is saying to you, Victory Outreach San Diego, to get ready because he's about to turn the tide of the battle in your life. You ain't saying nothing this morning. I need some people to begin to rise up. I know there's some people this morning, you've been fighting a war in your family. You've been fighting a war in your business. You've been fighting a personal war. But I got a word for you this morning. The tide is about to turn. The enemy's going to be defeated because the people of God are rising up. We're pushing back the enemy. We're pushing back the devil. How are you going to turn the tide? I'll tell you how. If you take your eyes off the assault and keep your eyes on the assignment. Take your eyes off the assault and, and keep your eyes on the assignment. Keep your eyes on the mission. Keep your eyes on the vision. Keep your eyes on the purpose. Keep your eyes on the destiny. Keep your eyes on the plan. Keep your eyes on the promise. And if you keep your eyes on the promise, guess what? The tide is going to begin to turn. I don't know it, but I feel inside of my spirit like the tide is turning for somebody this morning. The tide is about to turn. See, when I think of this victory, I can't help but to think about the church. I can't help but to think of the ministry of victory. I can't help but to think about our church. Someone say my church. God, God has given us a vision, hasn't he? God has given us a calling. God has given us not only a calling, he's given us also the power of his presence. What's the good news is that we're not penetrating enemy lines by ourselves, we are going in the power of the Holy Spirit. How many know that Jesus says, I will be with you? And you know what? He hasn't just given us the power of his presence, but guess what? We're working with a promise. See, we have a plan. God's given us a plan to reach the inner cities of the world with the message, hope, and plan of Jesus Christ. And he wants us to partner with any people and organization that has a similar heartbeat. And he's given us a promise. You know those promises. Isaiah 45, 2 and 3 says, I will give you what? The treasures out of darkness. But then there's another promise. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 2 and 3, he says to us, enlarge the place of your tent. Come on. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Do not hold back. Look at your neighbor and tell him, this is not the time to hold back. He says, do not Hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you shall expand to the right and to the left. And so here's your word this morning. Here's your beautiful word this morning. Here's your promise from God this morning. Here's how you're going to get your blessing this morning. We are in a season to stretch out by faith. We're in a season to penetrate enemy lines. We're in a season to build a base where God can do great things. But you're going to need faith. You're going to need faith if you want to experience the promise of God. Let me say this to you. Religion wants something that is old. But faith wants something that is new. Should I say it one more time? Maybe there's one or two religious people here this morning. Let me just go ahead and say it. Religion wants something that is old. Oh, take us back to the old days. Take me back. Come on, somebody. And I'm going to tell you, religion wants something that's old. But, but how many know we serve a God that says, I'm getting ready to do a new thing in your life. I'm getting ready to expand you. I'm getting ready to enlarge you. I'm getting ready to take you to a whole nother level. You see, how many, if I were to tell you that God wanted to pour out new wine, would you agree with me that God would want to do it in a new wineskin? If I were to tell you that God wanted to pour out new wine, would you agree that it's going to take a new wine skin to sustain that wine? And, and that's what happened last week when our, our five-star general, Pastor Sonny, was here. Come on, how many were blessed to just hear him? I'm going to tell you, he, him and Julie were so blessed. They texted Georgina the next day and said, Georgina, we are still glowing. We're still, they were in Panama. 
and we're just springboarded into Panama under the unction of the spirit of revival in San Diego. Come on, somebody. They were blessed. My brother-in-law, Sonny, who I love so much, I talked to him every day when he called me the next day. He goes, man, brother, what did you do to mom and dad? I go, what do you mean? He goes, you're making me look bad. <laughs> we had a Rolls Royce. Come on, somebody. It was first class. Everybody, because how many know that's our five-star general? Come on, how many know Pastor Sonny is our, he's our five-star, he's our Eisenhower, he's our Patton. Come on, somebody. I think Patton was four stars. But he's our general. And he came in here, and what did he do? He gave us a challenge, didn't he? He left us with the challenge. What was the challenge? He said, Victor Arch San Diego, it's time to stretch. It's time to begin to prepare a new wineskin. Because when you begin to prepare a new wineskin, that's when God is going to begin to pour out some new wine. And, and what he actually said to us, he said, I wish I had a sledgehammer. He said, because it's time for the church to knock that wall down and build a house for 1,400 seats. Who got a hold of it last week? And, and we've got a job that, that we've got to push down that wall. But here's what I recognize. Before you, can, before you push down the wall in the church, we've got to push down the wall in your heart. We're going to break enemy lines. Can I hear an amen? See, see he gave us a challenge. And, and the reason he gave us that challenge is because how many know th there's a great need? There, there's a great need in this world today. What is the need? The, the, the need is not for followers. The need is for leaders. How many of you consider yourself a leader? Yeah, come on, boldly. You say, I'm the leader of my family. I'm the leader of my business. I'm a leader in the church. I'm a leader. Come on, wait a minute. I'm a leader in the community. I'm a leader. I'm a leader. People look up to me. I got something to offer. And I want to tell you that the world is not in the need of copycats and followers and hype people. Come on, somebody. People who promise change but have no power to bring it. The church is not called to be powerless, but we're living in a day where God wants to raise up some real spiritual leaders that are going to make an impact. And that, that impact, my friend, is not only going to be here in San Diego. What if I were to tell you that out of San Diego, we could impact the entire world for the glory of God? Would you rejoice over seeing the world impacted through your life? This is powerful stuff. He left us with the challenge that the time has come to begin to see leaders who are, watch this, who are going to bring vision and hope. To, 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 to see leaders rise up, watch this, that aren't going to take life, but are going to give life. <laughs> Don't we get disappointed in leaders that take but we rejoice, the city rejoices over leaders who give. The Bible says when the righteous are in leadership, the city rejoices. And that's what we need. We need leaders in our city. We need leaders in our church to rise up with the right motives. Are you, are you with me? And so what the promise is and what the plan is, is to raise up leaders who will not take life, but will give life. Not only give life, but build life. Why do you come to church? Why are you here this morning? Because you recognize there's a vision in this church, not just to get you saved, but to build your life to the next level. And then the level after that and the level after that. Imagine that people who were counted out, people who were marginalized, people who said, no, what good could come out of the hood? We got a different testimony because he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to cast down those things that are mighty. Am I in the right church this morning? Is there anyone here that believes that he's a God that's able to do a work and build you? We're called to build lives. This is what we've been doing here in San Diego, isn't it true? And I want to remind you very quickly of the four-part mission of our church. I think, I think if you've never heard this, you need to catch it. If you're thinking about being a part of this church, you're going to love this this morning. The first thing is that Victor Eric San Diego is called to be a Holy Ghost hospital. 
We're a hospital for the hurting. That's our, that's our, that's our mission. That's our vision, to, to be a, a hospital for the hurting. What, what do we say to our city? We say, you know what? Send us your hurting. Send us your broken. Send us your loss. Now I sound like the Statue of Liberty, don't I? Send us those who have needs in their life. We know how to work with them. Send us your bound. Send us your addicted. Sounds a lot like Jesus. He said, I didn't come for the people that are well. I came for the people that are sick. And, 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 and let me say this, and you can rejoice or not, or I don't know if you get embarrassed about this stuff. I don't. But when I came to Victory Outreach, I came hurting. How many of you came hurting? How many of you came broken? How many came and you said, I made some mistakes in my life? But how many can give God praise that God used the church to put you back together again? Come on, that's our vision now, to, to, to see God put lives back together again. And I want to tell you, you're not a statistic. You have potential. The greatest potential sits in this room, sits in this place right now when God's able to heal you and restore you. And, and I'm going to tell you, why, why, why can we restore? Why can we heal? What qualifies us? Because we know what it is to take the medicine. We've been healed ourselves. And when you've been healed by the power of God and you've taken the medicine, who's taking the medicine? Now you can give the medicine. Come on, give God praise. We're a hospital. Secondly, we're a family. We're family. We're, we're the family of God. We're, we're, we're a spiritual family. We're not ashamed to, to say that. We're not ashamed to present that to our community that we're a spiritual family. And isn't it true that when you're family, a family gives you a sense of belonging and purpose? Isn't it true that when, when you're a family, because this is one of the core values of our ministry, that a family gives you that sense of belonging how many know it feels good to be a part of something? It feels good to be a part of something. In, in this church, we don't X anybody out. We want as many people to be a part of what God is doing here as we can. There's no room for discrimination. There's no room for, for isolation. There's no room for division in this place. Because how many know we are a family? We are family. And we want to begin to see the family grow. Wouldn't that be great? Isn't there great rejoicing when the family grows? Come on now. You know it's true. Back me up. When a baby comes into your family, everybody buys socks and little shoes. And, and grown men suck on bottles filled with confetti and candy. Come on, somebody. And there's rejoicing in the house. That was the promise of Isaiah 54, he said, sing, oh, barren woman, because you, they, I, they said you couldn't have a baby, but I'm about to give you a baby. Enlarge the place of your tent. Make room for the baby. Build an addition. Victory Outreach San Diego, it's time to make room for the babies. Not one baby, not 10 babies, not 100 babies. We're going to believe God for 600 babies to be born. Help me rejoice in advance right now for what God is about to do in the family. See, our, our, our vision and our mission here at San Diego, Victor Irish, is not to impress you. You know, there's so many, I, I think so many churches sometimes are trying to be cool. They want to be cool. Pastors that want to be cool. Leaders that want to be cool. And, and you know, we're from the hood. And you know, just like me, there ain't nothing less cool than a person trying to be cool. That's why people come in here, they say, Victor, I said, you got it going on, brother. But I said something different. I guess we're not trying to be cool. We're just being ourselves. God's given us a special anointing. We got a spirit of family. Come on, somebody. We don't want to impress you. We want to refresh you. This is a place that many people call home. This church is a church that many people call home. Even in the mother church, the, the, the theme and, and, the, and the model for many years and still is, is a, a people you call family, a place you call home. Lately, I've been thinking of changing our model to that because that's, our, that's a good model. We're, 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 this is a place that many people call home. 
And, and people that call this place home are not just people that come to our church, but do you know that there's other pastors that call this place home? There's other leaders in the ministry and in the city that call this place home, and, and they say, when I come to Victory Outreach, I just feel something that I don't always feel. I feel family. I feel like you could touch people, talk to people. Come on, somebody. That people are genuine in this place. Is it true? And, and they, they say, and when I walk into the church, different pastors that come, we had a number of pastors that come. They're friends of ours. And when they come, they say, Pastor Al, I, I, I feel free. I feel like I don't have to fake the funk. I just feel like it's a place where I could take off my armor. I feel like it's a place of hospitality. Where when the women serve, man, they serve with a smile on their face and a joy in their heart. Come on, somebody. They don't serve me on a paper plate. They serve me on a real plate. And, and it's just a place of love. It, am I talking about the right church this morning? And pastors come in and they, and they sense a spirit in this place. What is the spirit they sense? They sense a spirit of revival. A spirit of freedom and liberty and the power of God. How many know that's what family is all about? What's the third calling of our church is to be a school. Listen, not only a family, but a place of preparation. That's what church is. That's why we tell you all the time that Sunday morning is not enough. Tell your neighbor, Sunday morning is not enough. Now, I know I preach good, but I don't preach that good. There are men and women in our church that are even more qualified than me to train you. And this is a place of preparation. I make you say amen. Our vision is not just to reach you. Our vision is to train you up. Our vision is not just to get you in the seat. Our vision is to get you in the seat, train you up, and send you back out into the streets. Filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. And our vision, come on now, I don't know if this gets you excited, but I know it gets me excited, is that we want to train a generation of leaders in this place. We believe that God has not only called our church to lead locally, but he's called us to lead regionally, and he's even called us to lead in different parts of the world. Come on, how many believe it? Thank you for those that are backing me up this morning. How many believe it? We're called to be a spiritual base where spiritual leaders could rise up and bring the breakthrough wherever they go. Why is, why, why, why is Sammy and Daniela bringing the breakthrough in Africa? Because they were trained in San Diego. Why is Michelle Castillo bringing the breakthrough in Chicago? Because she was trained in San Diego. Why are Gary and April bringing the breakthrough in Sacramento? Because they were trained in San Diego. And that's what God wants to do. Listen, you may feel like God can't do anything with your life. And I came to tell you that's a lie from the pits of hell. God wants to use you. God wants to anoint you. God wants to empower you. And God wants to send you out. Whether he sends you around the world or he sends you across the street. Tell your neighbor, get ready. You're going out. And that's why, that's why you got to understand the purpose. What's the last thing here? And I'll be done. We're an army. We're an army. How many, how many believe that? We have a vision and that mission is clear. And, God, and you know that God has called us to move as an army. You know, in order to be an effective army, you got to move it. You, you got to be able to mobilize it, right? Right, Juan? Look, if you can't mobilize an army, you ain't, you're more on the defense and, and, and not on the offense. And, and I believe with all my heart that we're called to be an army that's trained, prepared to move to wherever God leads us, whether it's to move to a conference whether it's to move to a retreat like the gang is going to this week, whether it's to move to the East Coast invasion where we're taking 30 soldiers out to the East Coast and we're going to win heroin addicts and gang members and, and we're going to spread a lot of love and help that church. Come on, somebody. We're an army. Someone say, we're an army. We're an army. And let me tell you something about this army, the army you're involved in, this army, your church. We're not sending babies into battle. We're a mature army. 
we don't, we're not babies going into battle. I know some of you have a baby face. Like me. No, I'm just kidding. But, 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 but brother, you, you, you're not a baby no more. Mm-mm-mm. And you know how I know you're not a baby? Because you've been being tested. Oh, come on. You, 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 you've been being tested. And I came to tell you, you survived the tests. This is a good place to get excited. You, you survived the test. You, you've been being tested. There are some of you that you have fought some battles. You, you fought some battles this year. You, you fought some battles last year. And maybe even in the past, you fought some battles. And you, you might have even taken a, 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 le- a loss here and there. But I came to tell you that you also know what it is to have some victories through the battle. Because if you didn't have the victory, you wouldn't be here this morning. You wouldn't be here in your right mind. You wouldn't be here in your right heart. You wouldn't be here with your spouse. You wouldn't be here with your children. You wouldn't be here looking the way you do. You need to give God praise. Because you've been trained and you've made it through the war and you've made it through the battle. You didn't look at the assault. You looked at the assignments. And that's how I know you're trained. That's how I know you're ready. And what we're saying this morning to you, church, is that this is our moment. This is our moment. Look at Jeremy and say, this is our moment. This season that we are getting ready to go into is a season that for me and Georgina has been 10 years in the making, 16 years in the making, being in the city of San Diego. And I came to tell you, everything we've done is to get us to the point where we are today. This is our moment. And you know what the mission is? The, the, the mission right now is to grow the army. That's what Pastor was seeing when he came. He came out, he looked at all you, he looked at all those graduates, he looked at all those people, you guys were looking great last week. What happened this week? No, I'm just playing with you, you look great today. You were looking great last week, you, you were here, you had the joy, you had the, you were ready, you said, Pastor, we're here, the general's in the house, you stood at attention, you had all your badges on, I seen a brother with this United We Can, his lion's breed, his Victor Outreach bad, he had a Victor Outreach shirt on, he had some Victor Outreach socks on, he had a hat in his backpack, come on somebody, he was ready to let the general know, hey, I'm a part of the army, and I'm ready to be used by God. And you know what our pastor saw? And he said to me, he said, Al, grow this army. There's something good taking place in San Diego. Push that wall back. Come on. Get the sledgehammer. Knock it down. And begin to multiply this army. See, if we're going to grow the army, we've got to have a bigger base. We, we, need, we need a new wineskin so that God could pour out some new wine. Does this get you excited? How about on the back? I know some of you are like, what? Do you, does it get you excited to be a part of something like this? Does it? Or, or do you want to be in an ordinary, boring church where they give you three points and a poem? Or do you want to be a part of a spiritual revival? It's okay. You want to be a spot? Yes, she wants to be a part of it. Do you want to be a part of a revival? Or do you want to just be, it's okay. It's okay. She's good. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's all right, sweetie pie. Go with them, mama. Mom, come get her. Look at me. That's what happens. Huh? Babes and sucklings will sing the praises of God. If you won't praise them, God will raise up a childlike spirit to praise them. The stones will cry out if the people of God don't catch the vision. He says, I can raise me a nation out of some stones. Come on and praise him, everybody. Come on and just praise him right now. I'm almost done. I I got a couple more things to say, but praise him right now. Okay, be seated very quick. Say, this is my moment. This is our moment. There's three things we need to do right now. Number one, we need to continue 
to prepare and equip. This is not the moment to leave the church. Okay? This is not the moment to get cold on me. This is not the moment to get casual on me now. Don't take a spiritual You can go to the beach, but don't take a spiritual vacation on me now. Go to Disneyland, but stay spiritual now. This is a time to prepare and equip. How many agree? And that's why if you're not in the flow, the family life, or you haven't signed up, sign up today, please. Sunday morning is not enough. We need to train you. We need to equip you. We need to impart into you. We need to strengthen you. We need to build you. We need to make you that leader God's called you to be because we believe in you. Sign up after service. Be here next Sunday. We need to continue to prepare, continue to just do what we're doing. Right? Not waver, not look to the left or right. Just keep doing what we're doing. Continue to raise up those leaders. But not only prepare the people, we need to prepare to get that wall back. And pastor said, you know, get a sledgehammer. So I got one and I hit the wall and it's concrete, so it didn't take it down. (laughs) You see these black beams up here? These are strategic beams. They they actually go into the ground. So they go across, but then they go down, go across, and then they go down. And there's a number of them here. So what we did, I asked Brother Paul Ludden. How many love Brother Paul Ludden? He's a blessing. <laughs> Him and Rosalind. He moves quick, too. I, I said, Paul, when I meet with you, can you get these blueprints? And find me a civil engineer. Just find me a civil engineer to get this wall pushed back. I said, brother, the next day he had blueprints, the whole building. He went, found a civil engineer, submitted the blueprints to the civil engineer. And next week, we're going to go in there and tell them this is what we want to do. We want to have a 1,400-seat auditorium. (laughs) Did you know that that would be one of the biggest church auditoriums in all of San Diego? You Come on. Come on now. How many could see it by faith? Religion wants what's old, but faith wants what's new. And, and, and we've done that. We, we're preparing. We've got to continue to prepare and equip and build. What's the second thing we need? Not only to, we need to prepare and build, but secondly, we need to passionately give of our resources. We need to passionately give. I, I thank God for many of our people who not only give, but, but they passionately give, you see. Passionately give with, you know, with, with the joy and with the with the in the sense, having a sense of vision, saying, Pastor, we see it too. We see it too. And, and they give passionately of all that they have. And, and, and I believe that for some of you that maybe you've given passionately in the past, we need you to rekindle your passion to give once again. We really do. We want it with passion now. Now, we'll take it with, with grumpiness, but we want it with passion. <laughs> Because you know why? We want you to be a part of it. How, how many say, I want to be a part of it, Pastor? Isn't that exciting? And, 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 and we need that passion rekindled. And then we need some of you new ones. Maybe you're visiting from other churches. You're making decisions about coming here. or You know, you, you just came back to the Lord. We need you for the first time to kindle your passion of generosity. To understand that there's a blessing on the other side of your giving. We need to rekindle and kindle the passion for giving because I believe that as we give financially and as we take it to another level, see, see, when I talk about rekindling the passion and kindling the passion, I'm talking about understanding the difference between a sacrificial seed and a safe seed. See, a lot of times we're used to giving a safe seed. What is a safe seed? A safe seed is a Seed that you're comfortable with giving. You give $100 and, 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 and you give it, but it's safe. You, you know, it's like, yeah, I can give $100. I, $200, sure. $500, yes. But what God wants to do is he wants to move us from giving a safe seed to giving a sacrificial seed. As we push this wall back, we're going to need people that are going to rise up that are going to give more than $2,500. 
more than a thousand, more than fifteen, more than five. We, we might need some people going to give twenty thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand, because that's what sacrifice is all about. It takes courage and sacrifice to break through enemy lines to shake the enemy, to confuse the ranks of the enemy. It takes a group of people who were underestimated to rise up and courage. Yeah. I was hearing a story about a church that was blessed. I was just hearing it yesterday. This lady was sharing about her church out. She's out in, in the Midwest somewhere. And they had a building, an uh, older building, kind of like ours. It was a storefront. It was a big building. And it was built in the 80s, and they needed to remodel it. And I thought, man, your church was built in the 80s. Our church was built in the 60s. And she, they had to remodel the whole building. They had rented it, and then they ended up buying it for half price. And then now they were going to raise $2 million to remodel it. And she said it was an old building. She says the, the air-conditioned units on our building were 40 years old. And it took, she believed the angels of heaven kept that air, AC pumping. She said when they went up there, there were squirrels living in the AC. And she was talking about how they were believing God to raise money. And she went to, uh, and, and she went to a conference. And she heard the pastor preaching. And she felt the lead, her and her husband felt led to sow a seed of $5,000 in that, in that service. And she says, I really need, we need a miracle in this building. Because in it, our, our, our church, you know, uh, during the service, the roof is, is kind of messed up and people are getting baptized during service. <laughs> you know, they had so many leaks and the roof was so old that, 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 that there were, people were getting wet during the preaching. I said, oh my God, that reminds me of my... <laughs> <laughs> and, and the building needed to be remodeled and rehabbed. And, and so she said by faith, she, she st didn't sow a safe seed. She didn't have the money, but she sowed a sacrificial seed of $5,000. And then she went home after the conference. She said when she got home, she got a phone call from the city. And her and her husband got the phone call. And they said, uh, we wanted to ask you a question. Uh, do you have hail damage on your roof? And the pastor said, hail, yes. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> Hail yes. The roof was going to collapse. The city goes, we want to go see the building. Let us go see the building. They went over to the building, walked on top of the building, and the man said to them from the city, he said, you have recent hail damage. I can see it. I see that you have varmints living on your ceiling. There's recent hail damage on the ceiling. He goes, I'm going to call you in two days. After he went to his office, he gave them a call in two days. He says, I want to share something with you, Pastor. He said, the city's going to give you a check for $500,000 to fix your roof. <laughs> I heard that story, and I said, Lord Jesus, if it can happen for them, why can't it happen for Victory Outreach San Diego? You've given us a vision. You've given us a people of faith. We've been faithful to the vision. We've been faithful to the promise, and we're ready to sow the seed. This is our moment. She sowed the seed, and God opened up the door. How many can say amen? And what's the third thing we need as I close, Matthew? Not only do we need to, to prepare and equip, and passionately give of our resources. But lastly, and I, this is the most important point I want you to hear. We need to pray. How many know nothing happens without prayer? Prayer activates the supernatural in our life. Prayer gives us influence with God. Prayer moves us to a place we've never been. In order to have great faith, you must spend time connecting with God. If you want man things, connect with man. If you want God things, connect with God. When Jesus fed the 5,000, you know the story, he had the five loaves and two fish. He, he, he took the bread, 
The Bible says he, th- he gave thanks. He broke the bread. Watch this. Then he prayed. He took the bread, gave thanks. He broke the bread, and then he prayed, and then he gave it, and it went boom, 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 Come on, church, wake up and help me give God praise. Boom, 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 boom. What do you need? Boom, boom. And multiply. See, we're a spirit-filled, presence-driven church. Church, And I want to tell you the three levels of God's presence in our life. I want you to learn something very quick. Number one is omnipresence. This is the, this is the level of presence everyone has. How many of you everywhere at all times? God is everywhere at all times. And sometimes as Christians, we walk knowing that he's everywhere at all times. He's everywhere at all times. But here's what I want to tell you about omnipresence. Just because he's everywhere at all times, it doesn't mean that you're walking closely with him. Or that he's walking closely with you. There's a second level of presence. It's called personal presence. There's omnipresence. But then the second level of presence is personal presence. Say personal presence. This is the level of presence when you pray where he says, I will be with you wherever you go. Wasn't he with you in the courtroom? (laughs) And God knew you prayed. Come on, God knew you. You were like, oh, God, touch this judge's heart. Help this DA, Lord, because he knew. Come on, somebody. And didn't he show up? Come on, didn't he show up? Wasn't he with you in the hospital bed during that surgery? See, that's personal presence because you have omnipresence where he's with you and he's everywhere. But then you have personal presence where you pray and he shows up where you are and he says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Just pray to me and I'll send angels to guide you. I'll send angels to help you. Come on, how many know that's true? That's powerful. Personal presence. But here's the level of presence I believe our church needs to get to. You ready for it? You ready for it? We have omnipresence. He's everywhere at all times. We have personal presence. We've experienced that before. He's with you where you go. He's pray, God, be with us with you. But here's, here's the third thing. It's called manifest presence. And this is the level of the presence that we are in right now. This is the level we need for the season we are in. And let me tell you about what this means, manifest presence. It means when this level hits you, now you can do things you've never done before. You can do things you've never done before. Omnipresence, he's there, he's everywhere. Personal presence, he comes to your aid. Manifest presence is where now you can begin to do things you've never done before. Ooh, this is so good. I don't know about you, but I want to say, God, I'm ready to do things I've never done before. Re- remember Peter, Louis? All the disciples were either in omnipresence or per- they were just in omnipresence. Peter, he went straight to manifest presence and he stepped out the boat. And the Bible says he walked on water. And he got shook, like, whoa. And then Jesus said, where's your faith? What he was telling Peter is, where's your faith for this level? Because you can move at this level. He said, greater things than these you will do. And I came to tell you, there's a greater things anointing. A greater thing's power on a people that will pray for his power. Come on, somebody. You need to clap. Uh, I don't know about you, but I want to do things I've never done before. I want to see things I've never seen before. I look at this wall. I've been looking at this wall for 16 years. I don't want to see that wall anymore. I'm ready to see 600 new souls give their life to Jesus. I want to step out 
in manifest presence. Who, who, who wants to move like that? Who wants to make history? Because the history you make here will be the history that hits your home. The breakthrough you create here through God's help is going to be the breakthrough that hits your home. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I want you to lift up your hands tonight. And if you're ready for the presence, the manifest presence in your life, you're ready to step out and do things you've never done before, lift up your hands all over this place. Please don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave during the altar call. This is the moment where you need to stay in church, not leave church. This is where the Holy Spirit begins to fall. you got to learn discipline now. Come on, lift up your hands all over this place right now and say, God, I'm ready. This is my moment. This is my moment, God. This is my moment to do what I've never done, to see what I've never seen, to experience the great things that you have for me. Religion looks back. Faith looks forward. I'm ready to step into the unknown territory of your promise. Lord, you've spoken to me. You've, you, you, you've, you've done that work in my life. Oh, Jesus. Lift up your hands right now. I want to pray for some of you that you need Jesus in your life. Hold on. You say, I want to accept the Lord right now. I want to step into something I've never stepped before, waving me side to side. You want to accept Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe and I receive salvation through your blood. I believe you died for me. Your blood cleanses me. And you give me that redemption that I need. Lord, I also believe you died, were buried, and you rose again on the third day so that I could have eternal life. I believe, Lord, you're coming back with power and authority. And I pray, God, for your Holy Spirit to fill me and make me brand new. Lord, do a work in my life. Say, Lord, give me a vision and a purpose. Thank you, Jesus. And everybody just lift your hands and thank him right there.